Scripture calls us out of our religious inconsistencies and spiritual fog, that existence where we still carry the baggage from our previous belief system and religion. It draws us to clarity and keeps us in truth. Perhaps that is why it was easy for the Samaritan to come back to thank Jesus, the centurion to recognize the Messiah when his own couldn't, and the Samaritan woman to realize truth and relish true freedom. We have a terrific program and a great lesson to discuss. So before we start, why don't you introduce yourselves and tell us your favorite type of food. My name is Vanessa, and my favorite type of food is Indian food. I will eat it breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the rest of my life. I love it. Mm. I'm going to marry it. <laughs> I was waiting for you to keep going. Um, my name is Angela, and if I could, I would eat pupusas from El Salvador every single day of my life. Mm. And mostly for breakfast. It's especially good for breakfast. Pupusas. <laughs> uh, my name is Elroy, and I think my favorite food keeps changing. Right now, it is uh, a black rice. Uh, I think in Haiti, they call it John John. It's mm. so delicious. John John. Mm -hmm. I feel a potluck coming on. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. And my name is Phil, and I'll say my favorite type is Ethiopian. And I, I have a lot of fun just eating with my hands. So mm -hmm. that's that's a bonus. Okay. Nice. You could do that with other foods too. I could, I could. <laughs> Cup it. And... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as we get into our study, why don't we start off with uh, our Bible verse and prayer? And Angela, do you mind? Sure. Our text is from Matthew 12, 18. And it says, Behold, my servant who I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you just to ask that you open our eyes. You've given so many good lessons in this study and we ask for you to reveal them to us. In your name we pray, amen. 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 Well, we all come from different backgrounds, and um, I've chosen all of us to be part of this discussion for that reason. So why don't we just start off? To what extent has cultural difference affected your own personal life? Well, mine is pretty close to home. I married a different culture. Um, so our house, I'm pretty American, but I, I think my heart is a couple different mixes of things a little Brazilian, a little Central American, but my husband is Peruvian. And so our marriage, not only is there miscommunications and such just between individuals, but we have lots of fun cultural miscommunications too. <laughs> does, I'm just curious, when you guys get into arguments, do, does it flip over to a different language? I argue in Spanish, yes. <laughs> he stays in English pretty well, but I go to Spanish because my goal especially when I'm upset, is to make sure that he understands me. So I go to his language so that I know that he can't say that he didn't understand any of the words I was saying. <laughs> so it's just my, it's my natural reaction. That's the opposite of what Ricky Ricardo would do. Yeah, <laughs> just start yelling in Spanish. Although I will say that's a good option if you just need to get emotion right. out it feels without insulting more someone. full in spanish i'll work yeah. on it yeah <laughs> it's just it's just more uh. <laughs> well arguments aside what other i guess experiences have you had i i grew up in new york city uh, there's everyone from everywhere and i can't say that i was ever affected either positively or negatively by my um you know, my background, my parents were born in Puerto Rico, I was born in the Bronx, um, and it was never a thing. I never thought about it. But then moving to Korea, I, I lived in Korea for three years, um, teaching English and working with the, you know, with the church out there. And, um, and that was very difficult because you feel that 
uh, a culture that is different from the one you were raised in um, is backwards. I would think I would use that word a lot. Mm -hmm. This this thought process or this reasoning or this way of working is backwards, and so it affected me in having to to just really grow up and say this is not wrong. It's different and assimilate because I was in their country, so. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point because I think of that, um, you know, with culture in my life because I, I grew up in the U.S. I've lived my whole life in the U.S. and I feel like I don't have many cultural differences besides like a few interactions. But I found that age was kind of a cultural difference mm. for me mm. in the people that I dealt with. Mm -hmm. And you're right because I often think with kind of older adults or younger, you know, teenagers or whatever, I think, man, you've got it all wrong. Mm -hmm. like this is the way that you should see the world or this is the way that you should interact or, or things like that. Mm -hmm. And I find myself struggling with those cultural differences just even in age within my own culture. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. I think uh, ex exposure affects experience. Mm -hmm. And so same thing, like Vanessa, I grew up in New York, uh, you know, in, in my primary school, my principal was Russian. You know, I was the only African American in my class. You know, I was there with somebody from Hungary, from, from Israel, from, from South Africa. I mean, it was weird, but at the same time, it was, it was relatively amazing because there were people with all these different experiences. And so because of the exposure, you know, I didn't feel any particular kind of way as to say, well, my culture is better than yours. It just made me appreciate, you know, their culture a little bit more, so. Yeah, and I think especially when you're looking for the positives, my husband will tease me mercilessly that my personality goes along with my language. That in English, I'm very serious. <laughs> in Spanish, I'm usually angry. <laughs> I don't know why. And Portuguese is my happy language because that's the culture that I picked up along with the language. So it, it got me into that every time I speak in it. I'm like this. So I think even culture, the more that you gather, the more it kind of brings out different things in yourself even. You know, from what you said, the lesson that I learned just now was if we hear you speak in Spanish, we should <laughs> kind of back off. <laughs> just run. Yeah. Just calm it down a little bit. So talking about cross-cultural ministry and missions and all that stuff, what do you think could make someone reluctant to be involved in cross-cultural missions? I would just say fear. Yeah. Fear of either... I had two fears. One, of offending, because, the you know, Asian cultures... It's very, there's formalities and, and a whole other level of being polite and being respectful and I was afraid that I wouldn't get it right or um, that they, they wouldn't accept me for who I was. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. yes, I respected the fact that I was, I went to their country and I was living there and receiving a paycheck and, you know, being approved by their government to be living there. Um, but I, I would never be Korean. So I think it's one or the other. Either we, we fear... Offending or we fear being um, being placed on this totem pole where my my cultural background is more valid or more important than yours. And I think especially with mission, if you're going in to share something new, mm. then you have even more of that fear that I don't want to tell you that this the Bible is right because I'm from such and such a culture. It's hard to separate those two things out mm -hmm. to go in and say no this this is valuable for you regardless of culture mm -hmm. not because I'm saying it or because this person or this pastor is saying it but because it can really make a difference in your life. Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lack of knowledge lack of exposure and also um, I think there could be even issues with stereotypes, you know, there mm -hmm. Uh, you can live in a, in a metropolis or a city, what have you, and there are just certain sections where you're just like, I'm not going there because if I go there, I'm going to be, you know, uh, just singled out and I could feel very afraid because that's not my culture. And so I, I just don't know how to associate or assimilate. And so what do I do? And I think often that fear often freezes people. And so you think about it in terms of mission. It's like, I don't know. I don't want to go over there. You know, they do crazy things over there. Uh, so because of that, I'm going to hold back. So. And I feel, it's so cliche, but I feel like knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in my, my travels, which weren't missions, but, you know, even travels to different countries and things like that, the reasons that I held back from interacting more was because there was a lot that I didn't know, whether it was the culture or the language or anything like that. You know, 
even my brother recently traveled and you know we were talking about the various places that that he went to and that was educational for us because we think oh isn't that isn't that country behind in technology or you know and he even said like he felt so much safer being in these other countries than in the US and we often think you know because we're in the culture like this is the safer culture or the most advanced or anything like that mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a powerful thing. We need to learn about the other cultures as we're ministering or before we minister. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. So in our lesson, it talks about the Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, the, the whole story is that Jesus went up to this Samaritan woman as a Jewish man. Um, and he basically ministered to her. And so it's in John 4. We're not going to read all of John 4. Um, but what can we learn from the story about how Jesus witnessed to non-Jews? I, um, I believe it's in the lesson that it brought out the fact that he said directly to her, I am the Messiah. And then, and then from his own culture, they had, were constantly asking him, mm. are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? It was like this, this mystery. Um, and for me, it, it was just, we, we have biases that we're not aware of and, and, and blinders or or tunnel vision sometimes, and I feel like she didn't have that. The Samaritans didn't have that kind of tunnel vision where they're looking so hard they couldn't see, or they knew the scripture so well that they'd lost their meaning, or whatever the case may be. I feel like he, Jesus knew what to say to who and why, and and you know he could anticipate what they would do with that information. Whereas if he had just been so direct with the Jews, it would have had a very different result than he was so direct with her and she immediately went and carried the message of hope and love um, because, because she was from a different culture. It, her, her reaction and her handling of that information was very different than what a Jewish person would have done, I, I think. Yeah, she had a very different openness mm -hmm. to receiving it. Mm. Yeah, it was just such an unraveling of the story because first he asked for a drink you know, and then she's like, what? Uh, do you know the rules here? Uh, right. We don't associate mm -hmm. together. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but he goes beyond that. And he doesn't just call her out, um, you know, with the whole water instance, but the deeper meaning, like the, the people that, sh that she was living with, you know, the guys that she was living with in her lifestyle. And so eventually she's like, wait, what a minute? Like, are you mm -hmm. a prophet? Like, you must be a prophet or something. So the, the conversation grows deeper and more intimate mm -hmm. in a way. And Christ is like, not only do I want, am I asking for water, but I also want to give you you know water. So I think there was a, such a beautiful exchange there. Yeah, and it it almost seems like it was such a short amount of time, mm. but it, it seems like he was going through a process of building a relationship with her. And he didn't just come to her and say, this is what I can give you, this is who I am, and leave it at that. But he really, he engaged with her. He you know, went beyond just what she was saying and just even what he was saying. He went deeper into all of that, like you said, in a more intimate way. But relationships are often some of the best ways to understand people, especially from different cultures. Right. Because you can study about them, mm -hmm. but then it's such a big overview. and You get such a different picture, but when you develop a relationship with someone and really kind of get into well, why are you saying this? What is it that you're really wanting? Mm. Then it's a completely different understanding because like you said, there's right. so many different ways to be human. Mm -hmm. And that's what he dealt with. He dealt with a human regardless of, right. of what her culture was. But now I was just thinking about how while I was living and teaching in Korea, I taught adults, not children. And so I had, um, I had some of my young ladies who are in their 20s and they would become instant best friends with me and would talk with me and tell me things. And I'm thinking to myself, don't you have a Korean friend that you should be telling all these <laughs> things? And it was, it was just different with me because I, I wasn't Korean. I wasn't gonna judge them for what they were telling me. I didn't have the same value set. I wasn't gonna have the same reaction. Um, and so I, I just found it so fascinating that that bridge was, was deeper and, and quicker than the bridge that they had even with their own Korean friends and their own culture that they'd had for years. They still felt more comfortable telling and, and expressing with me because of, because of that difference. You know, and I like what you're saying, Vanessa, because um, I feel like that story that you just shared mm -hmm. parallels this story in right. the Bible perfectly where Jesus saw this woman who, you know, he could have reached her more than maybe her own people because mm -hmm. of, you know, her lifestyle or whatever. 
And I also see that in this, he saw a woman who was really receptive to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so he reached out to her directly. He, he shared with her who he was. He kind of, he, he revealed to her who he was. And then he then allowed her to then go into the rest of her people and share who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's kind of a powerful thing. And I, I don't want to put down our huge, big, you know, net events or tent meetings or anything like that because they're really powerful and they have great, um, great effects. But I feel like we also neglect the individuals that work on a smaller level mm -hmm. or, and we forget to like celebrate those who, you know, they're working on with the people one on one. -on -one and in the end, that's having a ripple effect that's mm -hmm. just a huge effect. Mm -hmm. I love that. All right. So, oh, one other thing I wanted to bring out and then I want to ask, but like the other thing that, that Jesus did was he kind of neglected the man-made rules. Mm -hmm. And there are man-made cultural rules that affected this, this interaction with this woman. As in, you know, a, a man shouldn't be by himself with her, mm -hmm. you know, someone that isn't family. Um, so I guess like he kind of went out of his comfort zone. So what's the extent that we should go out of our comfort zone or should we even need to go out of our comfort zone when ministering? Yeah, I think when ministering, I think ultimately it's for the greater good. And so, you know, sometimes there are rules there to protect people, but sometimes there are rules there just for the sake of, of um, there being rules. And I think if you break those rules and you're ultimately doing it for trying to, uh, change the person's life or trying to help deliver that person and then then I think it's okay and I think that's what Jesus did he was such a revolutionary in that case where he just says you know forget the rules I understand what man says but I am the man I am the man I am not uh, the, the rules that combine uh, or constrict your life I'm the one who's actually going to to deliver you I am the water that you're really searching mm -hmm. for so yeah. I, I my favorite saying is that you need to know the rules in order to break them properly and I think it applies in culturals where yeah. you, you are learning about the culture, you want to know, be educated, respect what exists, but at the same time, if you, if you allow yourself to be confined, then you're not going to make any difference and you're not going to be able to introduce something new and give it to them in the context of their lives. The context of Christianity in the Korean culture, in the Japanese culture, in the you know, Malaysian culture, all this, it's, it's very different. It's the same Christ but it's very different context. And so for me, that was my, what I learned to do in Korea was like, just smile and nod and be like, oh, I wasn't supposed to do that, oops. But I got my message across and now boom, it's like, ooh, tell me more about Jesus. Ooh, let's read the Bible. Because it's provocative when you, when you cross what can be crossed um, in the Holy Spirit's leading. Well, and there's, you've got the example of the Roman officer who he understood the rules between Romans and Jews. Mm -hmm. where like a Jew wouldn't go into a Gentile home. Right. So he never invited Jesus to come right. and to, to heal his servant like in his home. He went out mm -hmm. and, and asked Jesus for the healing. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that because he, he had the faith and the faith wasn't going to hold him back from asking for healing from Jesus, but he also respected the culture. Mm -hmm. And so he was going to, to work according to that so that he wasn't asking you know, for Jesus to break his culture. Mm. Mm, yeah, I think I see a lot of people, like rules, in my opinion, are there in some extent to protect us. I see why they exist. But I also see people who go a little bit beyond rules for a purpose of, of reaching someone. But at the same time, strictly keeping rules will sometimes keep you from getting any message across. Mm. I remember one of the most painful things I ever saw in, in a public evangelism was the pastor was calling everybody forward and he said, come with me and I'd like to pray with you. And someone comes who didn't understand, I don't think even just the Christian culture that was there and started coming up on the stage <laughs> because the pastor said, come stand with me. And so he started going up the stage and the pastor goes, no, 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 you stay down there. Mm. Mm. Ooh, that wow. was so painful for me mm. to watch yeah. because I can see, and it was being televised. Mm. So I could see where he's going, oh no, we need to keep some sort of order for, for the cameraman and everything. But it was just so painful because you know that that, that strict rule keeping is now going to have a negative impact on that person. Mm because they remember that moment of, of 
you know, embarrassment mm -hmm. because they were doing the wrong thing and they were outside of a culture mm -hmm. where it would have been very easy to just step outside of the rule for yeah. a little while and say, okay, well, you come up here. Okay. You'll be on screen with me. <laughs> and, Big deal. Right. right. And so in some ways, the rules get right in the way of, of what you're actually trying to express. And it's mm -hmm. a challenge to balance that. I mean, I can, I can understand both sides because mm -hmm. you, you kind of get stuck with your rules, or your norms, or what's expected, and it's easy to kind of stick to that. So whether it's rules or cultural things, whatever it is, how do you find a balance between adapting our mission approach to the student and delivering the curriculum? So how do you, how do you reach the people that we need to reach and yet still keep in, within the cultures and yet still keep the truths without losing the truths? I think you find the good within each culture. I think each culture relatively has good principles that they abide by, something that uh, you know gives them a, a healthy lifestyle, a healthy way of expressing themselves. And I think when you identify those goods and you marry them with um, your own good principles, I think that ultimately leads to a great experience. When you ultimately go into another culture and you start pointing out their faults and pointing out their issues, that creates the arguments, the dissonance, says, if you will, and you're never going to get anything accomplished. Well, I'll never say never, but it usually ends up being a bad experience. Yeah. So. I tended to focus on um, what for me are two universals, which is family, the love, the um, agape love of God that exists in every culture, no matter what. There are mothers, there are fathers, there are spouses, there's children. That love if you tap into that, figure out the culture and tap into that and parallel that when you're trying to share the gospel, they get it. Um, and then you're past all barriers with that. Um, and secondly, unfortunately, pain is one of them. Um, where, when people experience death or they experience disappointment, um, one, one problem in, in Asia is, is suicide, um, where the students, either college or high school, they're not performing well enough. And people lose their children um, to that. So for me, those were the two things where it was kind of like the gospel remains the same when you connect it to those kinds of universal things that are all humanity understands, a, a smile and a tear. So, mm. Yeah, I think going off of universal truths, I think another very important step is listening. And I think that should happen before the majority of, right. of anything takes place. Because as you listen to an individual, as you listen to multiple individuals within a culture, you start to see and identify some of these issues that keep coming up or universal truths. Mm -hmm. And you realize what's important to them, what their way of thinking is, how they process. And it makes it a lot easier to link that with with truth that you have and with lessons that you're there to, to help give them instead of just coming in and going, listen, I know you're all like this. Let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because not only does that create barriers right off because mm -hmm. you're setting yourself self up as the expert, most people are much more willing to listen and even willing to ask you about your beliefs if you've listened to them first. You know, as I was reading this lesson, I was reminded of a book that I read by, written by a missionary called Peace Child. And the story is that he went to, mission, uh, to be a missionary to people in the jungle. And so he got everyone together, all the men, and he was sharing the story of Jesus. And he said that like, as he was sharing the story, they were all bored. He could tell that they had like, lost interest, they didn't care. And then he got to the part of Judas, mm -hmm. and they all got excited. Wow. And they, they started making their like signs and, and sounds of admiration. And this <laughs> culture was a culture where they celebrated and their heroes were traitors that turned on their own people. And so they saw Judas as the hero of the story wow. because he became a best friend of Jesus and then turned on Jesus. And it was, it was this reminded me of how, how you've got to get to know the cultures and understand the cultures if you're going to minister to them because you need to understand what they value. Right. And in the end, the whole reason it's Peace Child is because he learned that, you know, their culture, when they would create kind of a contract of peace with another culture, they'd exchange a baby. And as wow. long as that baby was alive, there was peace between those nations wow. and tribes. Wow. So he brought in the whole thing of Jesus was the Peace Child. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. And Jesus is still alive and will always be alive, so we always have that peace. Wow. But it wasn't until he Mm -hmm. discovered that cultural, like, norm that he could actually share the real gospel with them. And he still kept the truth. Right. But he had to learn how to adapt it for what they valued. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Because the message is not changing. What's changing is how people receive it or how people, whatever way you figure out to get people to understand it. So it's not the, the message itself, but the delivery that. That's crazy. I'm seeing, a, I'm seeing a pattern here. You know, even from the very beginning of our discussion, it's like you have to listen before you speak. And a lot of times we want to go and speak and then listen, you know, listen to their demands, listen to the culture. The whole thing with, uh, you know, listening is all about being a servant. And it's funny that you actually brought up the, the word hero. Because if I'm not mistaken, I heard something before where it says hero in, um, in Latin. Um, I think it means servant. There's a very close connection there. So actually being a hero is actually serving. A lot of times we want to go out and, and be the hero in a sense of, oh, we're going to save the day for the people that need uh, the, the most uh, saving, you know. Mm-hmm. But we need to go and truly be a servant, to listen first and then to be able to de- deliver a message afterwards. And my wife and I were talking about this, and she brought up a good point, which goes along with what you're saying. She went to two universities. One would do a lot of missions outside internationally. And, you know, she even signed up for a mission trip where I think all they were going to do was play soccer with kids in this other country. Mm. And she thought, like, like, that's a benefit, but is that really, are we really Mm. doing what that community needs? And the other university that she went to would have a lot of clinics and a lot of things for their community. And they kind of, they'd look internally to their area, see what the need was, and then they'd say, all right, so how can we meet this need? And to her, that always really affected her because it wasn't going out there and saying, okay, so like, what can we do as missionaries to really help out people so that we can, you know, feel good and know that we're doing missions? It was more of like, all right, so what does the community need that we can, we can meet and we can use our resources and talents to do? Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. In just a couple of sentences, um, tell me kind of what you learned from this, your favorite point of this whole lesson. I think my favorite point is that God is very individual. He reaches us all in in different ways, in the ways that we need, and he takes us all on very different paths. For me, it's um, the beauty of diversity. and, And, you know, when we have a problem, we want everybody to be like us. But at the end of the day, how boring and how lifeless, you know, would this world be if we were all the same? So it's kind of seeing the beauty of God through all our differences, and we can still be united, even despite how radically different we think we are. For me, everyone has a need, and, you know, I think it's just best to meet it their way, but through God's will. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I've really enjoyed this discussion. If you'd like to contact us, please visit our website at www.sabbathschoolu.org. That's www.sabbathschool, the letter U, dot org. Remember, the goal of Bible study is information and transformation. It's for the head and for the heart. For Sabbath School U, I'm Phil Riley.